13 hours, 30 minutes until the massacre at Firth Asylum. Dark. Thirsty. I had been hospitalized only once before, for a concussion and some cuts in a fractured eye socket I suffered in a car accident, and for a minor gunshot wound unrelated to the accident. I don't recall any of it clearly, it happened during a period of my life that has mostly lost my memory. But one thing I do recall is the long, slow, touch-and-go, bobbed consciousness that came with the artificially induced coma of anesthesia. Sights and smells drifting in under the haze of nonsense dream logic, and a sense that the world had skipped ahead in time without me. And under it all, the thirst. This was like that. My last solid memory was stepping through the porta potty stepping out of the BB's restroom door and into a shouting, shoving crowd that had gathered behind the store. The people were being herded into that spot by National Guard, confused, scared kids with assault rifles and no protective gear. Somebody started shooting and a head burst like a balloon next to me, the dead guy flailing back through the door I had just exited. Days had passed since then. I knew that. I could feel it in my sore joints, and I had a vague sense of cycles, of consciousness and unconsciousness. Sleeping through a night, drifting in and out of a day that was just as dark. I had been moved, and moved again, rolled down a hallway on a gurney. I recall having an IV in my arm for a while, and then it, they took it out, and then put it back. I had been outside at some point, behind a fence, talking to other people. I remembered screams and panic, all of it just flashing through my brain, like headlights passing a bedroom window at night. There and gone. Meaningless. Sleep. Awake. Dark. I had eyes. I felt the twitch of my eyelids opening and closing, though the view remained the same either way. Was I blind? I moved my right arm. I couldn't feel the dragging weight of plastic tubes attached, so I had been unhooked at some point. With some effort, I lifted my hand to my face to see if my eyes were covered. They were not. I blinked. I tried to lift my head and groaned. A bolt of pain fired up my neck. I looked around for the glow of a digital clock, or a slit of light under a door, or blinking green lights on a console measuring my vitals. Nothing. I tried to sit up. I peeled my back off of the sheets, but my other arm wouldn't come with me. I tugged on it and heard the clank of metal and felt cold steel around my wrist. I was handcuffed to the bed. That is never a good sign. I peeled apart dry lips and croaked. Hello. Nobody would have heard it unless they were sitting on the bed with me. I tried to swallow and give it another shot. Hello? Is anybody out there? Something about the echo of my voice told me I was in a small room. Hello? I waited, for the sound of a shuffling nurse's footsteps outside, or even the jingling of keys in a burly prison guard to tell me to shut the hell up or he's going to put me in solitary. Nothing. I thought I de detected the sound of water dripping somewhere. Suddenly, I was certain, absolutely certain, that I had been abandoned here. No question. They had stuck me in a building, chained to a bed, and left me here to die of thirst. They didn't even leave a light on. I'd lie here, for days, pissing and shitting myself, like a neglected dog in a trailer park whose owner was off doing meth somewhere. Hey! Anybody! I yanked at the cuffs. It didn't do anything but make an irritating noise. I couldn't even see the door. There isn't a door. They just built up a brick wall over the opening, or locked me in a shipping container and bulldozed a thousand tons of dirt on top of it, or sank it to the bottom of the ocean. Hey! Hey! I got one leg up. Neither was restrained as far as I could tell, and kicked at the railing the cuffs were attached to. I had no strength in the leg. The railing didn't give. Hey! God damn it! Sir? A tiny voice. I froze. Did I actually hear that? I blinked into the darkness, stupidly, looking for movement. Somebody could have been sitting on my lap and I wouldn't have seen them. Hello? Is somebody there? It's just me. Sounded like a little girl. Can you be quieter? You're scaring us. Who are you? I'm Anna. Is your name Walt? No. My name is David. Who's Walt? I thought they called you Walt earlier, when they brought you in. No. Oh, okay. Wan. They probably said Wan. That's my last name. David Wan. Are you from Japan? No. Who else is in here? Just us. You, me, and Mr. Bear. Okay. Anna, this is gonna seem like a weird question, but is Mr. Bear an actual bear or stuffed bear? He's stuffed when grown-ups are around. 
Sorry if I scared you. What are you doing here, Anna? Same as you. We might be sick and they want to make sure other people don't catch it. Where are we? Why didn't you ask that question first? What? It didn't make sense to ask me what I was doing here if you didn't know where here was. Are we in the hospital? No answer. Anna? You there? Yes, sorry. I nodded my head, but I forgot that you couldn't see me. We're in the old hospital, in the basement. Then where is everybody? And what happened to the lights? You can ask the spaceman when he comes by again. There are lots of them here before, but everybody has been gone for a while. I didn't need to ask who the spaceman were. Guys in contamination suits. How long has it been since they've come by? I don't know. I don't have my phone. It was two sleeps ago. I'm sure they'll be back soon. Maybe they close on the weekend. Do you remember when they brought you here? Sort of. They came and got my dad, and they told us we couldn't go home and moved everybody downstairs to the special hospital. And that's where we are now. In a whisper, she said. I think we should be quiet now. How old are you, Anna? She whispered. Eight. Listen to me. I don't want you to be scared, but they left us here with no power, no food, and no water. Now hopefully they'll come back and take care of us, but we have to make plans assuming they won't. If you drink all of your water, you can have some of mine. I... Do I have water? Where? On the table next to you. I reached over with my right hand and hit a row of shrink-wrapped bottles. I dug a bottle out and drank half of it and went into a coughing fit. Shh. We really should be quiet. There's a box of granola bars and stuff over there, too, but they're not very good. Why are we being quiet? I think I hear the shadow man. I choked on my water. Shh. Anna, we... Please. We laid in there in silence, floating in still darkness like a pair of eyeless cavefish. Finally, Anna said, I think he's gone. The shadow man? Yes. Describe him to me. He's a shadow with eyes. Where did you see him? Over there. I can't see where you're pointing. Over in the corner. When? When did you see him before? I mean, she sighed. I don't have a clock. What? Uh, what did it do? It just stood there. I was scared. Mr. Bear growled at him and he eventually went away. I had read somewhere that you could get out of handcuffs if you broke the bone at the base of your thumb. Or maybe just dislocated it. Either way, I have to find out if my legs were strong enough to do that. The issue would then be trying to get the presumably locked door open one-handed. Maybe Anna could help me. I said, Okay, we have to get out of this place. They told us we couldn't leave. Anna, you're going to find out soon that grown-ups aren't always right. We... Let's just say that it's better if we're not here when that thing comes back. But if it does, I don't want you to panic. I don't think it's here for you. I think it's here for me. Yes, that's what he said. He talked to you. She hesitated. Sort of. I could hear him. I don't think he had a mouth. Like Hello Kitty. And what did he say? I don't want to repeat it, but I don't think he likes you. I said nothing. Anna asked, Do you want Mr. Bear? No, thank you. I pulled my hand as far out of the handcuffs as I could, which wasn't far. I could feel the little knob of bone stopping it, two inches down from the thumb. If I yanked it hard enough, surely it would scrape off that bone and the blood would lubricate it. Be a matter of not passing out from the pain and me being too much of a pussy. Metal scraping. I was about to ask Anna what she was doing when it registered that holy shit that's the door, the door is open. I sat up and threw aside the blanket. The room was bathed in light. A pair of powerful flashlights in the doorway, side by side like the eyes of a giant robot that had poked his head up from the floor. I was momentarily blinded by the light, but I squinted and looked to the corner, yelling, Anna, get! The words died in my mouth. The room I was in now, now fully illuminated by the flashlights, contained a small bedside table, a toilet, a filthy sink, and one bed. Mine. I was absolutely alone in the room. On the floor was a tattered, filthy old teddy bear. Gloved hands grabbed me, holding me to the bed. It was two dudes wearing decontamination spacesuits, but the suits weren't white. They were black, and they had pads on the arms, torso, and thighs like body armor. 
Their face plates were tinted, so you couldn't see the face of the wearer. The cuff was removed from the bed rail and locked around my other wrist. Leg irons were placed around my ankles. I was dragged from the bed and marched down a long hallway lined with rusting steel doors, just like the one I had been yanked through. There were other people here, roused to life by the sound of us passing their cells. I heard an old man screaming for his wife, or daughter. Katie! Katie! Can you hear me? With no response. I heard a scraping from behind one door, like somebody was clawing to get out. I heard someone beg for food. I heard someone beg for pain pills. At the moment I passed a particular door, a male voice on the other side said, Hey, buddy, hey, open this door for me, please. It's my wife. My wife is in here and she's bleeding. I'm begging you. I stopped. I'm here. What's... The gloved hands clamped on me again to pull me along. Hey, are you going to help that guy? Hey! No answer from the guards. From behind me, the desperate voice begged and howled and wept. The hallway came to a bend and continued to the right, but I was stopped in front of a TV screen that had been mounted on the wall. There was a speaker mounted below it with a push-to-talk button. The screen blinked to life, and there was a man in another decontamination suit. This one the normal, friendly white like you'd expect from a government agency. The face behind the clear pixie glass mask was familiar to me, with the neatly cropped silver hair and weathered wrinkles. Good morning, Mr. Wong. How are we feeling today? Dr. Tennant? What the hell are you doing here? Am I dreaming this? If we just keep answering each other's questions with questions, this conversation won't go anywhere, will it? I'm feeling like shit. Why are you here? You don't remember. Obviously not. What do you remember? A bunch of guys in spacesuits were shooting people in BB's parking lot. Got sprayed all over me. Next thing I know, I'm chained to a bed in this prison. Now my therapist is here for some reason. Prison? Is that where you think you are? There are tiny rooms with locks and handcuffs and I can't leave. Call it whatever you want. How long have I been here? You honestly don't remember. Anything at all? No. You've lost all memories from your arrival until now. Think hard for me. I don't remember anything, goddammit. I completely understand your agitation, but I'm going to have to beg for a little bit more of your patience. I'm part of the team sent to observe you and the others. We're trying to get you well. He looked down and was doing something with his hands, tapping on a laptop, making notes, immune to the sound of muffled suffering echoing down the hall behind me. Doctor, is somebody going to help those people back there? That would be... ill-advised. I assure you that the patients who actually need help <clears throat> are receiving it. Again, this is not a prison. So am I free to leave? If I'm satisfied that you're stabilized, you'll be free to rejoin the others in quarantine. Where's that? Over at the hospital grounds, the primary quarantine area. But I can't leave there. I'm afraid not. The government would have some very strong words for me if I were to let any of you wander out. Where am I now? In the old Firth Asylum, the abandoned TB hospital just down the street. Temporary Raper Command Center and Patient Processing. I thought he said Raper and decided then, then and there that I had lost my mind. The WHO Command Center? R-E-P-E-R. -E -E Rapid Exotic Pathogen Eradication Slash Research. A not widely publicized task force for situations like this. What situations are like this? You and I have had this conversation before, by the way. I know what you're about to ask next. Are John and Amy here? And once again, I can tell you we have three Johns. Washington, Rawls, and Przinsky, but no Amy's. I had a dozen follow-up questions. Were they okay? Did they get out of town? Where were they now? But I knew this asshole wouldn't answer them. Wait, did you say rejoin? So I've been in quarantine before. We brought you over for testing, but... We're ready to transport you back. Testing. Yes, we're still trying to perfect our method of detecting the infection. And this test wiped out my memory. That's merely a side effect. One I do believe is temporary. How long have I been in here? Here, or in quarantine in general? Let's go for the second one. Ever since the outbreak. And how long ago was that? Longer than most of us would have preferred to stay. Let us just put it that way. Ah, oh, fuck you. And you get to keep us here, forever, until you figure out how to cure the infection? If you have a better idea, you be sure to let us know. Trust me, no one is enjoying this. The best thing you and everyone else can do is cooperate. He finished his laptop work with a flourish of key taps and looked me in the eye. So, in that spirit, tell me how you are feeling. 
Why is it dark in here? Electricity is out to much of the town. We have diesel generators, but they are insufficient for the whole facility, so we are forced to pick and choose. Other than your missing memory, are you having any other symptoms? Dreams? Hallucinations? Well, if I was, I wouldn't remember them now, would I? You know me, you know, because I'm missing my goddamned memory? Of course. How are you feeling, physically? I have a headache and my joints hurt. Those are expected side effects of the tranquilizers and being bedridden, and also should pass quickly. Do you recall why you were put under tranquilizers in the first place? Any question you ask that begins with the words, do you remember, is going to be answered with no. <laughs> Understood. Do you feel like you are up to rejoining the others? The others? How many others are there? Can you tell me that? In the primary quarantine area? Nearly 500. At one time. Jesus Christ. And how many of them are people like me? Who do you know, who you know goddamned well aren't infected? Now, David, can't you see that I do not know that? Do I fucking look infected? Ah, I see. Due to being muddled by the medication, you are missing some key information about our circumstances. It turns out that appearances are not a perfect indication of infection. Not, unfortunately, until it's too late. So hopefully you understand that we must take precautions. Dr. Tennant, can you hear the fucking people behind me screaming for help? Can you hear them over this intercom thing? Which people? The gentleman asking help for his wife. We lost two staff members trying to help that man's poor wife. If you open that door, you'll indeed find what looks like a very frail, wounded woman. If you get within striking distance, you'll find that woman as the transfigured ton of a grindworm. A what? I'm sorry. We have to come up with names for the organisms the parasite transforms its victims into. Without getting into detail, let me just say that we spent 16 hours trying to recover our two staff members from the creature. Their screams echoing down this hall the entire night, and next day as they were slowly twisted to pieces. The creature has been spitting splinters of their bones under its door ever since, so hopefully you understand why we're leaving that door locked. Fool me once, as they say. So, you just lock up everybody and wait for us to turn monster? As I said, we're making progress. But regardless, this conversation is only wasting time and taxpayer money at this point, when all I need to know is if you feel up to joining the others out in the fresh air and sunshine of the hospital lawn. We need your room, to be perfectly frank. Yeah, whatever. Great, great. If you turn to your right and continue down that hall, you'll find an elevator. And then what will- The monitor blinked off. One of the two guys behind me told me to hold still, and unlocked my cuffs and leg irons. He pointed and threw a speaker in his helmet, said, End of the hall. I said, What about the girl? Sir, move to the end of the hall. There was a little girl in my room, named Anna. I don't know if she snuck in and back out or what, but she was in there right before you guys arrived. The guy gave a glance to his partner. Uncertainty? The partner said, Move to the elevator. Are you going to go back in the room? I obeyed. My unsteady footsteps echoing in the dim hallway where the only illumination was dribbling out of a set of emergency lights to my left. Way down to the end was a barely lit elevator standing open. Halfway down, I turned and looked back for the two guards. Not there. Just lonely blackness beyond the pool of emergency light. God damn, did this seem like a long walk. My legs were weak and shaky. How long have I been strapped to that bed? What kind of drugs did they put me on? I felt my face and had no bandage there. Just a little bump where the spider had bitten me. Where were John and Amy? What happened to the town? Had the world ended? Why did this hallway smell like shit? Walt. A whisper behind me. I stopped and held my breath. Had I actually heard it? I continued, the elevator waiting right up ahead in the darkness, barely enough light inside to fill the tiny space. I stopped again. I thought I could hear smaller, lighter footsteps trailing mine, or maybe an echo. I whispered, Anna? Not sure any sound actually came out. I turned and walked as fast as I could toward the open elevator, without breaking into what could be called a run. I made it inside, spun around and punched the button that said 1. All the other buttons from there up had been covered with electrician's tape. Nothing happened. I was standing under what seemed like a 25 watt bulb that was slightly brighter than a candle. Dead silence. No. Wait. There was a faint sound. Not footsteps. A light scraping. Then a brief pause. Then the scrape again. The irregular rhythm of somebody trying to drag or carry an awkward load. Or maybe just trying to walk with a severely wounded leg. Getting closer. Louder. 
I cannot make out a smacking, sticking sound, like a person loudly eating pasta right next to your ear. I punch the one button again. I punch the closed door button. I punch the one button again. Then I mash the buttons under the electrical tape. All of them. Walt. That wet sound, scraping toward me. I could hear it clearly now, not ten feet away, moving faster. Walt. 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 The door closed. If they didn't want the patients at the undisclosed Firth Asylum Command Center slash patient processing facility to feel like prisoners, they were doing the world's shittiest job. In the light, I saw I was wearing a green prisoner jumpsuit. When the elevator arrived at the top, two more black-suited spacemen roughly dragged me out, put a black hood over my head, and threw me into the back of a military truck. The hospital was just a couple blocks away, but the trip took 20 minutes. We drove, stopped, waited, drove, waited again. Then an alarm went off and I heard an electric sound like a garage door opening. We rolled forward for five seconds, then the sound again, and the clicks of latches. Then there was another gate opening, followed by the opening of the doors of the truck. I felt sunlight and a blast of cold air hit my hood. I was dragged out and told to lay flat on the grass. I was told that if I raised any part of my body before commanded to, I would be shot. Holy shit. They yanked off my hood. The truck left, and I risked craning my neck enough to see a chain-link fence roll shut behind it. I turned the other way and saw that there was another fence. I was in a gap the width of a city street, between two tall fences that were each topped with coils of fuck-you razor wire. The inner fence, the one opposite the one the truck had just slipped out of, was opaque. They had attached tarps or some plastic sheets to it. The goal was clearly to make sure the separation between the hospital quarantine and the outside world was absolute. The plastic sheets were colorful and had printing all, on the, all along them. The one nearest to me said, 91.9 K Rock Rocktober Rockaca Rock Rockacalypse. Fuck me. I wondered how long they'd leave me laying like this, but soon a gate in the inner fence slid open and a voice from a PA system told me to go through. I obeyed and entered quarantine, apparently for the second time. I didn't know what I was expecting to find inside the gate, but it was just from the hospital lawn. The building itself was immediately to my left. I'm sorry, right. The front lawn of the hospital stretching off to my left. The sun hatefully spat daylight into my eyes. How long had it been since I'd seen the sun? And I gathered it was probably mid-afternoon or so. My first thought was, ribs. Meat smoke hit my nostrils, like being downwind from a barbecue joint. I heard voices. Somebody laughed. Hell, it's a party. What was a stranger than... What was stranger than that was what wasn't there, men in spacesuits carrying guns. I assumed I'd be roughly dragged in and told to go report to this tent or to submit to some tests or shit, but I was on my own. No soldiers. Nobody who looked official. No staff. Instead, a smattering of tired-looking people in jumpsuits, some with hospital blankets wrapped around their shoulders, were staring at me like they were expecting someone else. When they saw it was me, they all shambled away without a word. Well, screw you too. I spotted a pillar of smoke a hundred yards or so away, off near the fence that wrapped its way around the perimeter of the hospital grounds. A fence that did not, did not exist the last time I was here, and that was covered entirely in garish ads that were each... wrong somehow. Like they didn't have a big enough tarp and covered it in rejected billboards somebody with had laying around in a warehouse. Subway, come taste our new beard. I wandered toward the fire, having absolutely no idea what else to do. It was the same strategy I employ at parties. Find the food first. My lungs quivered at the contact with the chilled air. Not an unpleasant feeling. Kind of felt like freedom. Hey, Spider-Man! Spider-Man's back! The voice came from above me, and I admit my first reaction was to glance around for the actual Spider-Man. Why not? He wasn't here. I found the source of the voice, a black dude poking his head out of a fifth floor window of the hospital. I had no idea if he was talking to me or somebody else, so I kept walking. I couldn't help but notice the window he was yelling from was not open. The glass was busted out. That seemed weird to me. I passed a fat lady in a dark green janitor's jumpsuit like mine, sleeping under a blanket on what looked like a waiting room sofa that had been dragged out into the yard. The upholstery was discolored, like it had been rained on. I kicked an empty water bottle. It skidded and bounced off another one. Trash was everywhere. I noticed somebody had knocked over the Florence Nightingale statue, laying on its side like they had just toppled a dictator. I shuffled toward the bonfire. A lot of people were congregating over there, 
everybody wearing jumpsuits, either green like mine, or blood red. Tenet, tell me this is not a goddamn prison yard. I passed the main entrance to the hospital. The sliding glass doors were propped open with two overflowing garbage cans. From the dim reception area inside, it appeared the whole building was without power. Post-apocalypse. How long had it been? A year? I wondered if the White House was trashed like this, the Lincoln bedroom full of refugees, or zombies. I caught a whiff of that meat smell from the fire and my stomach growled. How long since I'd eaten? I felt slightly thinner, though that could have been due to the huge jumpsuit I was wearing. A clump of red jumpsuit guys were up ahead, talking and eating from bowls. I was going to ask them where the food table was, but at the sight of me, they all stopped talking, giving me a look like I was a cop, and they were all hiding joints. Everybody had patchy beards. Greasy hair. Nobody shaving. Nobody showering. On the ground were discarded plastic forks and paper plates tattooed with old grease stains and muddy shoe prints where they'd been stepped on, stepped on a dozen times. The huddle of red suits on the opposite side of the bonfire also fell silent. The bonfire, by the way, was a crackling pile of smashed furniture, wooden pallets, at least one mattress, and bundles of what looked like blackened sticks. Everybody looking at me now. I scanned around for some fellow green jumpsuits, but there was just one guy who looked about 80 years old, and another middle-aged woman who looked like a school teacher. Her eyes showed no signs of even vague interest in the situation. The biggest of the reds, a guy with shoulder-length blonde hair and more neck than head, said, We about to have a problem here? He had the voice of man with four testicles. His jumpsuit was zipped down to reveal an iron cross tattoo on his sternum. Not that I know of. Can somebody point me toward the food? Nervous glances. Was the food a sensitive subject around here? Nobody seemed to have barbecue ribs. Four balls said, You playing a fucking game here, bro? Have we met? Man, just fuck off. If I agree to fuck off, will you tell me where the food is? The man scowled and said, Ask Sal where the food is. Go ahead. He's right there. <laughs> he nodded toward the bonfire. A skinny guy with a bandage covering one eye said, Let it go, man. Walk away. He said it to me. Why am I the only one who has to walk away? Maybe I want to enjoy the fire. Fourball stepped toward me and said, Dude, you got five seconds to walk away or else you're going in there with Sal. I don't give a shit what anybody says. Wait, do you have me confused with someone else? Whoa, whoa, from behind me. It was the black guy from the window, green suit. Easy, man, easy. Dude just got out of the hole. Four balls said, I don't give a shit. Black guy grabbed my sleeve and pulled me away, saying, let's go inside. It's cold out here. I went with him and realized he hadn't come alone. Four more green suits were with him. Wait, were we on teams? What the hell was this? Had I stepped, in, stepped into some weird alternate dimension? Again. Man, we didn't think you were coming back, he said. This is just in time, too. We got the warning buzz about 45 minutes ago, so a truck gonna be here any time. I said, I don't underst I didn't understand one word of that. Just short of the front door, we stopped, leaned into my ear, and screamed, We got the warning buzz 45 minutes ago, so the- My hearing is fine. I don't know who you are. I've lost time. I have no memory of all of this. Last thing I recall, everything was going to shit out there, out in the town. Then I woke up in the basement of that old creepy-ass TB asylum down the street, in the hole, is that what you call it? The black guy rubbed his head and said, Shit, you get knocked out over the head or something? No, they said it was a side effect of whatever they did to me over there. He let out a breath, glanced around nervously and pulled me inside the hospital. The place was absolutely trashed. Once upon a time, there had been a huge oval-shaped desk right inside the doors where you could check in with a row of secretaries who would log you into their computers and put a band on your wrist, filtering out the people who didn't have insurance. Now there were just ragged splinters and deep gouges in the tile where the desks had been roughly ripped from the floor. The black guy said, Firewood. See, their plan is to take the easy stuff first, stuff close to the door, and burn it. That way, when we're all more tired and sick a month from now, the only wood left will be the shit that's hard to get to the tenth floor. Makes good sense if you're a fucking idiot. How long? Tell me. How long since the outbreak happened? About nine days. You don't remember nothing? Holy shit. We trashed the hospital this bad in nine days? Oh no, man. The CDC had staff here keeping things in order for the first few. Then they bailed out. We done all this since Wednesday. This is Sunday. And no, to answer your question, I don't remember anything after showing up here. I don't even know your name. 
Name's TJ. I knew John before all this. You and I met once at a party, but you probably don't remember that for a different reason. Wait, is John here? The guy said, nah, man. We got a lot to talk about. Let's get up to my room. Come on. He led me to a stairwell that was pitch dark and, despite everything else that had transpired, still smelled like hospital. <laughs> Old food, chemicals, death. I'm going to get rich one of these days selling a hospital disinfectant that doesn't stink of despair. We emerged into a fifth floor hallway and there wasn't anybody there who wasn't in a green jumpsuit. TJ announced, Look who's back! A chubby black guy who looked like he'd been dozing in a wheelchair said, Spider-Man, you escaped or they let you out. Before I could answer, TJ said, let him out, dumped him off on the truck just now. He's still groggy from when they sedated him. To me, TJ said, You hungry? They feed you? If you got food, I'll eat it. Then follow me. He continued down the hall. I got the feeling he was trying to pull me away from a conversation with wheelchair guy. From behind us, he said, Gonna need him out in the yard in about ten minutes. Buzzer sounded a while ago. TJ said, We heard it. We'll be there. We reached the last door at the end of the hall. Two hospital beds. Some cardboard boxes on the floor that looked to be full of ramen noodles, energy bars, and bottles of water. In the opposite corner, there were a dozen plain white plastic jugs. Looked like old Clorox bleach bottles with the labels ripped off. Something was written on them in Sharpie, but I couldn't read it. David! Yay! That came from one of the beds where a white girl with dreadlocks, thick-rimmed glasses, and a pierced nose was turning a sheet of paper into origami. She was wearing a necklace that it took me a moment to realize she had made by streaming lying through a half dozen of those red plastic caps from syringes. She gave me a smile that I thought would make cartoon songbirds come land on all of our shoulders. TJ hurriedly closed the door behind me and said, Got a complication here, babe. Dreadlock's girl got a crestfallen look and said, Oh no, please tell me. No, 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 it's not that. He can't remember anything. TJ looked at me and said, Right? Yeah. You recognize her? I'm, I'm sorry, no. Dreadlock said, Like amnesia? He doesn't remember his own name or anything? No, I remember everything until, uh, this. All, star all this started. National Guard come in and all that. I remember getting grabbed by some dudes, and then I woke up in the dungeon a little while ago. You don't know what they did to you? Over there? Nope. Sorry. She said, I'm Hope, by the way. The TJ, she said, Maybe it'll all come back to him? TJ shrugged and went to the window, the same busted-out window he had yelled from when I first showed up on the yard. I said, If you don't mind replaying conversations I'm sure we've had already, can I ask what the hell is going on in general? TJ said, Well, we're in quarantine, and beyond that, we don't know shit. This hospital was full of CDC and biohazard suits for the first few days. They had all of us confined in rooms with guards in the halls. But then some of the guards got infected, and that turned ugly. Screams from the halls. You look out there, those aren't coffee stands on the tile. Then that was it. They bailed out. All the staff. Some of them got evacuated. You could hear helicopters in the roof. Some they just left here. Now the inmates like us. Some got taken across the way where you just were. They just left the hospital to us. I joined TJ at the window and scanned the fences at the edges of the yard, trying to see what was behind them. I saw the tops of some white tents, but not much else. We weren't high enough to see much into the distance. I said, So what, the CDC just retreated over to the other building? CDC gone, man. They left. These other people swept in. Raper. National Guard gone too. They pulled out to the perimeter around the city. Left my ass behind. I said, Wait, you're, you're the TJ John mentioned? You were on the scene the day it all started. Yes, sir. National Guard. Deemed an infection risk. Some raper motherfucker thanked me for my service, took my rifle and sidearm, and left me on the wrong side of the fence. There's more than a dozen of us in here. At least, there was, anyway. The first bunch of us on the scene didn't have level C suits or nothing. Clusterfuck. From behind me, Hope said, Here, and handed me a crunchy granola bar, a little bag of peanuts, and a fun-sized Snickers bar. There's no hot water left from lunch, or else I'd have made you some ramen. Coffee's gone, too. Didn't last long. There's bottled water on the floor there. TJ looked appalled and said, Damn, girl, he gets the last Snickers? Almost had to wrestle a dude for that. To me, he said, Don't talk to nobody too much, all right? As you can probably tell from Owen down there, that was that was the dude, bro, with the big-ass hair and neck. Things are kind of tense. Tell people you're tired and you got that stomach flu or that you got a migraine, but I wouldn't let it slip with the memory thing. No need for a complication. They all still need you out there. Red and green both, so let's not upset their balance until we got to. 
You're our Spider-Man, and we don't got a backup. Okay, why does everybody call me? A buzzer sounded. An angry noise like the expiring shot clock in a basketball game. TJ said, Showtime. You can eat that on the way down. Just follow my lead. Don't say more than you have to. He picked up two of the bleach bottles from the corner and hurried out the door. There were half a dozen of us clomping down the stairs by the time we reached the bottom. I had been shocked when wheelchair guy got up from his chair to follow us. For some reason, it never having occurred to me that he was just using the chair as a chair, and in fact had no disability. In the stairwell, wheelchair said, Oh, I've been telling people that he was going to cure the whole next batch, saying it ain't worth the risk. TJ said, Well, we're going to have to talk to Owen, but it don't matter now. We got Spider-Man back. He hasn't failed yet. You're not going to write, Sp You're not going to, right, Spidey? I started to answer, but he caught me off with, You do this, we'll get you some rest. You probably just dehydrated is all. Out through the lobby and back into the yard, everybody out there was standing and staring. Not at me, but at the fence. At the gate I had just come through. Man, there's no guard tower or anything. What would they do? What would they do if we just tried to run? Just charge the gate when they open it? Nobody spoke. I could hear the bonfire crackling. Somebody had thrown some more fuel on it since last time, piling the scraps into a pyramid shape to create that jet engine afterburner effect for when you wanted your bonfire really, really hot. If there were soldiers on the other side of the fence, they weren't chatting or shouting instructions or doing anything else. I couldn't even hear idling engines. It really did feel like we were alone, and I couldn't shake the idea that we ju could just walk out. Maybe everybody with guns fell back and figured that they would stop the outbreak at city limits. So why not break out of here? Well, what makes you think the infection stopped at city limits, hmm? Last time you saw these guys in action, they didn't exactly have shit under control. There was a faded white line painted into the lawn, forming an arc around the gate like an NBA three-point line. No one crossed it. No one got within 20 feet of it. I opened my Snickers and shoved the whole thing into my mouth. I dragged my peanuts to my pocket, they had an American Airlines logo on the bag, and sat down on the grass. TJ roughly grabbed my elbow and yanked me to my feet. Do not fucking do that, he hissed. Shit, man, you forgot everything. I started to ask him if those two flimsy fences were really the only thing between us and freedom, but he shushed me. He leaned into my ear and whispered, Listen, man, buzzes sounds an hour before new arrivals. Buzza means nobody gets gets within a run for a distance of the gate. It goes off again right before it opens as a final warning. In a few seconds, a truck gonna come through here. It's gonna be full of new inmates. People that got rounded up off the streets before they might be infected. They get processed over the asylum and run over here. Then you gonna look at them and make sure they're clean. Right? And how exactly am I gonna... But I didn't need to finish that sentence. Check them for spiders. Because I can see the spiders. I'm... The Spider-Man. I glanced down at the two white jugs TJ had set at his feet. I found Hope standing behind me. She was chewing on her thumbnail. Nervous. Everybody was nervous. The air hummed with it. The fence closest to me displayed a picture of a woman's lower body wearing only underwear, a pink slogan saying, Victoria's Secret Christmas Panty Blowout. There was some faint clinks and all clanks in the distance. Having heard it before, I knew it was the other gate sliding open. Beyond the plastic sheeting of the inner fence, a military cargo truck rumbled in. We heard truck doors open and shut. Engine. Exterior gate again. Silence. The shot clock buzzer sounded once more, and the inner gate finally rattled open on its own. Laying on the grass in the exact spot where I had been minutes ago were four people. All of them young, looking to be college age. Three guys, one girl. The three guys were in green suits, the girl in red. Their hands were bound behind them. God damn it, muttered wheelchair guy from somewhere behind me. Wish they wouldn't lay them on the ground like that. Those dudes are going to get a shock one of these days when Carlos comes up for a snack. I swear that every other sentence somebody uttered in this place sounded like a foreign language. It was starting to piss me off. The four new citizens of the undisclosed spider quarantine stumbled awkwardly to their feet and shuffled into the yard. The split second the last one was through, the gate slid shut on its own. The mechanism was fast. I'd say two full seconds from fully open to locked. The huge blonde-haired guy, Owen, TJ had said his name was, shouted to them, Welcome to quarantine. Please listen carefully to what I'm about to say and don't talk until I'm finished. This will save you a lot of questions later. His voice echoed through the yard, huge lungs making the words split the air like a rifle shot in the woods. As you can see, there ain't no guards here. There ain't no feds. There ain't no soldiers. 
They ran out on us several days ago, and that's just fine with us. We have food and water, medical supplies. You're welcome to whatever you need. That's the good news. Bad news is there ain't no mail. There ain't no phones. There ain't no internet. There ain't no televisions or radio. What we've got don't get a signal. We are cut off. Owen paused to let that sink in. Also, there's no power. Maybe it'll come back and maybe it won't. We've been getting by without it, and we will continue to get by until somebody gets their shit together and comes and lets us out of this prison. Okay, so now that you're caught up on all that, let me get to the important part. There's a little more than 300 of us in here, and not a one of us you see here is infected. Pause again. He made eye contact with each of the four, individually. I thought Tennant said 500. Yeah, that's right. Only reason we're still stuck in here is because even after nine days, the feds ain't come up with a test that works. So they're guessing. And I'm gonna bet that none of you are infected, neither. So here's how we do it. We got an, experiment, an expert here who can spot infection on sight. He's gonna look you over, and once you've got a clean bill of health, we'll cut off those handcuffs, take you indoors, and get you set up with a room and some blankets and whatever else you need. Sound good? Nobody answered. Owen looked at me. The new kids looked at me. Everyone else looked at me. I was not breathing. TJ said, Do it, and then it'll be done. He walked me up to the first guy, a geeky-looking kid with acne cheeks. He was squinting because he had apparently lost a pair of glasses at some point. TJ said in a voice that, sounded, that suddenly reminded me he had spent some years in the military, I'm going to need you to open your mouth for my kiss, sir. The kid's eyes darted around, looking for someone to rescue him from all this. Man, chill out. I just need to check to see if a mind-controlling spider monster has possessed your head. He opened his mouth. Looked like a regular human mouth. Lots of cavities in his back teeth. I said, He's fine. The kid closed his mouth and his eyes at the same time, relief rolling off him like a boulder. All at once it hit me that I was the most powerful man in the quarantine. TJ said, What's your name, sir? Tim, said the geeky kid. Welcome to the quarantine, Tim. We're glad to have you. TJ spun him around and pulled out a pair of wire cutters. He snipped the plastic bands that served as handcuffs, and the kid immediately rubbed the deep red marks on his wrists. I moved to the next kid. Tall, square jaw, probably played high school or college basketball. Without me asking, he opened his mouth and moved his tongue around, making sure I could see everything. Confident. He was a guy who never failed a test in his life, mental or physical. Probably be a senator someday. Perfect teeth. I said, Yeah, he's fine. This one said, Kevin, as TJ snipped off his cuffs. Kevin Ross, and I can climb that fence in about ten seconds if we can get something draped up over that razor wire, rig up some carpet from in there, something like that. TJ said, Yeah, that thought was thought before. Didn't work out so well. Two people left now. The girl and a kid with curly hair who reminded me of Jonah Hill's character in Superbad. The girl was next. She was a hippie, I could tell, even dressed in a red prisoner jumpsuit. She had some haphazard braids in her hair and that dopey, trusting look in her eyes, like she was seeing the goodness of your soul at a glance. She gave me what I can only describe as a tragic smile and in a shaky voice said, Hi. What's your name? David. Just open your mouth for me, okay? I feel like I'm going to be sick, David. I'll stand off to the side then. This will only take a second. She smiled again. A tear ran down her cheek. I said, Come on, open up. She did. She was a smoker, apparently. The front teeth had some yellow. Not a single cavity, though. Good for her. She was fully crying now. I said, It's fine. It looks fine. You can calm down, okay? We'll all get through this. I put a hand on her arm. Look at me, acting all in charge and professional. Don't worry, I'm the expert. She whispered something between sobs and I couldn't make out. What was that? Check again. I can if you want, but because a week ago, I had a pierced tongue with a stud in it. She squeezed her eyes and sobbed, trying to suck in breaths to get the words out. And now I, I don't. What? I don't under... But I did understand. She woke up one morning and realized her mouth was not her own. Oh, Jesus. No, no, no. She held her mouth open. Extra wide this time. I didn't want to look, but I couldn't help it. And, of course, I saw it. 
Between her lower front teeth and her lower lip, two black mandibles rested there. I recoiled in horror. Everybody nearby reacted with me. Owen was already on the move, striding toward the girl from behind, with purpose. She went down to her knees, weeping. TJ got in front of me, pushing me back away from her. I said, Okay, okay, you, uh, you said you got a cure, right? We've got a procedure here? TJ said, Cover your ears, man. He was cramming something into his ears. It looked like cotton balls. The people around me were covering their ears with their hands. But why are we- Owen stepped up behind the girl, pulled an automated, automatic pistol from his waistband, and splattered her brains all over the grass in front of her. Her body flopped to the ground. The other three new arrivals flew into a panic. I had thought everyone was covering their ears for the gunshot, but then the piercing shriek started. The cry of the spider creature. I wedged my fingers into my eardrums as hard as I could. I could still feel it vibrating my bones. They worked fast. Owen, who I noticed had cigarette butts wedged into his ears, flipped the girl over. I could see the spider trying to detach and crawl out of her skull now, growing out of the girl's mouth like a huge, grotesque black tongue. TJ uncapped both jugs, then carefully poured the contents of one jug into the other, mixing something. After a moment, steam or smoke emerged from the opening of this new concoction. Owen stepped back and TJ poured the entire contents of the jug into the girl's mouth. The shriek was cranked up to a level that sent a tremor through my guts. The spider thrashed. The girl's cheeks and lips dissolved under the acid, the liquid running out of ragged holes in her skin. The spider was dissolving too, legs falling off as it thrashed. Eventually, the terrific cries died down, and it was still. Owen stuffed the pistol into his pants and grabbed the girl's feet. He said, Come on, before Carlos comes calling. The one I'd been calling wheelchair guy shouldered past me and grabbed the girl's wrists. They, they dragged her toward the, ro the now roaring bonfire. On the count of three, they tossed her corpse right into the blaze, sending an explosion of sparks heavenward. The flames tore into her flesh, and I smelled what I had mistaken for smoked barbecue ribs just minutes ago. Then, finally, I saw bones in the bonfire. Bones and bones and bones. It was full of them. Blackened skulls and ribs and pelvic bones and straight leg and arm bones jutting out like sticks. Hundreds and hundreds of bones. The girl's hair was burning. Her jumpsuit was peeling off of her in black strips, like the skin on a hot dog roasted over a campfire. I was just talking to her. I will remember that smell for the rest of my life. I will never eat meat again. Owen said to me, Get over it, bro. You got one more. No, no, that cannot be the only way to do this. Owen growled, Bullshit. You didn't have no problem when it was Sal you were calling out. Now you lose your fucking nerve? Man, I don't remember... Okay, look, that was then. That... That's the past, and it doesn't matter now. I can't do that anymore. I'm sorry. There was a commotion behind me, and TJ shouted, Hey, stop! Don't! He was shouting at Kevin, the basketball player kid. He was sprinting toward the fence. The kid leaped, landing halfway up the fence with his fingers hooked in the links. He scrambled up toward the razor wire. He fell. He hit the ground like a crash test dummy. Limp. Dead weight. A pool of blood spread below his face. A chunk of his skull was missing. I never heard the shot that took him out. I whipped my head around, looking for the gunman. I saw no one. In the sky were just some birds, gliding along with wings outstretched, riding the thermals, circling lazily overhead. Maybe there were buzzards, hearing the sounds of death like a goddamned dinner bell. TJ said, Stupid motherfucker. What, he thinks we're all here because none of us know how to climb fences? Shit, I could have given him an extension ladder. Got one in the maintenance room. The Jonah Hill-looking kid was paralyzed with fear. His hands were still bound behind him. His eyes were wide. His lips were white. His mouth clamped so tight it was pressing the blood out of them. Owen walked up behind him and put the pistol to the back of his skull. You check him, or else we cure him right now. Him and everybody else who comes through that gate. Fucking Carlos running around here, that's bad enough. Now multiply him by three, or six, or a dozen. The feds will come into this place a month from now and find nothing but chunks of meat and bones and crawling nightmares. Well, I got a wife I'm going to get home to. I got a kid I'm going to get home to. The feds left us in here. Left us to get torn to pieces. We're all we got. But when that gate finally opens up and they give the all clear, I'm walking out of here. As a man. Help me or don't. It's up to you. To the kid, I said. Open your goddamn mouth or he's going to shoot you in the head. The kid obeyed. 
I pulled at his lower lip, then his upper lip. The kid had braces. I saw nothing else. He's fine, Owen said. You sure about that now? Yeah. Owen stashed the pistol and used a pocket knife to cut the kid's hands free. What's your name, kid? Corey, I think I'm going to pass out. Owen grabbed a toppled wheelchair and sat it upright. Sit down before you fall down. Corey did, putting his head in his hands, trying to wake up from what he surely thought was a terrible dream. Owen, TJ, and Bruce, the wheelchair guy, went to get the basketball player's body away from the fence and presumably onto the fire. More bones for the pile. From behind me, I heard a warbly voice say, This isn't right. How can they allow this? Where's the government? Where's the army? Where's the police? That was the first kid I checked. Tim, the geeky one. Without turning to face him, I said, I think we're on our own, man. The men were dragging the basketball kid's body toward the fire. I couldn't watch this again. I turned to face Tim, who was sitting on the ground, cross-legged. Hey, I don't think you're supposed to sit on the grass. They get mad. Why? It upsets Carlos, apparently. Who's Carlos? I don't know. The groundskeeper? I kind of just got here myself. I could feel something. A rumble at my feet. Faint, like somebody using a jackhammer nearby, or thumping bass-heavy music. But there was no sound, just the tremor in the earth. Then, people were running and shouting. TJ was sprinting toward us and waving his arms. Get up! Get off the ground! That finally convinced Tim, who unfolded his legs so he could get up. His face froze, in an expression of confused shock. His jaw flexed, his mouth working to form silent words. His eyes met mine, and I had the thought that this is what people look like when they're suddenly stabbed from behind in an alley. Hey, are you... He howled in pain, pushed himself off the ground, but he looked like his butt had been glued there. He screamed again, a garbled and halting sound as if it was coming through a microphone that kept cutting out. Summoning the thrashing animal strength of a fox ripping off its own leg to get out of a trap, Tim got his feet underneath him and pushed his body up off the ground with everything he had. He rose a foot off the grass, and in a brief moment, I could see that something was still tethering him there. It looked like he was shitting spaghetti, a bundle of thin, writhing tentacles, turning and curling and spinning, working their way up into his bowels from below, like a puppeteer. Tim sat hard back on the ground. He screamed one last time, then spasmed into a seizure that mangled the scream into a spastic ugh, ugh, ugh chant. His eyes rolled back into his head. Sprays of blood erupted from his mouth. I thought I saw one of the thin, yellow spaghetti tentacles flick up between his teeth. Tim's body thrashed once, twice, three times. There was a huge, wet, slurping sound and then he slumped over sideways. When he did, he left behind a wad of guts the size of a potato sack. The yellow tentacles reached up and dragged the pink pile under the dirt, leaving behind nothing but a gopher hole in the ground, soaked in blood. An out-of-breath wheelchair guy stopped behind TJ and said, Fucking Carlos, man. Told you we should have killed him when we had the chance. TJ, seeming, ama seeming amazingly calm, because he's seen this several times before, oh goddamn, oh holy shit, sighed and said, Well, we didn't know that. We didn't know then what we know now, did we? What's important is that we do know it now, and that we follow procedure. He stared at me. Right, Spider-Man? I didn't answer. Owen stomped up behind me and jabbed his finger at me. He didn't spot the girl. You notice that? Far as I'm concerned, that's the last I want to hear about this so-called 100% hit rate, bro. Told you he's still groggy from being in the hole. Yeah, and about that, what went on over there? We don't know, do we? That may not even be the same fucking guy. He looks like he don't even know who he is. TG rebuttaled. Yeah, and that girl was wearing red. Or did you not notice that, Owen? That's three reds in a row. That's easily three out of every four infected that was in a red jumpsuit when they burned. What does that tell you? You want to have a talk about that, TJ? We'll convene a panel. You, me, and my Beretta 9mm. How about that? Well, fuck you, man. I love the way black guys say fuck you emphasizing the first syllable hard like a verbal punch. I wondered if they practiced it in front of a mirror. TJ and Owen stared each other down for a minute. Then TJ turned his attention to the curly-haired kid, Corey. Come on, let's go inside. It's gonna stink real bad once all three bodies get to burning. Oh, and welcome to quarantine. Everybody headed upstairs. TJ said, You should get off at the second floor and see the doc. He's been asking about you. Let him see about your memory and all that. Fuck that. I wasn't heading for the second floor or the fifth. I was heading for the roof. I had to get out of this goddamned madhouse. 
I wanted to get up there, to look out, to see what exactly was holding us in. TJ followed me, trying to tell me what he had done all this before, and that I myself had declared that there was nothing to see. He did not seem surprised when after hearing this I still insisted on going up. Five minutes later we were ten stories up, standing among the silent air conditioning units in the bird shit, looking out over the red and green figures loitering in the yard below. The wind picked up, garbage blowing around with it, fluttering paper plates and food wrappers. The trash was starting to pile up against the western fence like a snowdrift, and among all this, the inmates, clumps of red and clumps of green, huddled in conversation. It looked like the world's shittiest Christmas pageant. It had been a mild, uh, mid-November? Day. But up here, on the cusp of evening, it was goddamned freezing. I didn't care. I paced from one ledge to the other, scanning the landscape. The pulsing grip of a panic attack was slowly squeezing around my brain. Past Dave was right. There was nothing to see. A fence, another fence, and then the town. There were a few white tents set up outside the gate, but there were no guards walking along the fence with rifles. Nothing. That's not enough. That's not enough to fucking keep me in here. Why am I still here? Jesus, the smell of that girl's burning hair. I asked TJ, Where are the shooters? The what? The guns, man. The snipers, or whatever who shot that kid. They didn't shoot from the asylum. It's too far away. I stared off toward the asylum. The big, depressing, mossy, gray brick box sitting nestled among some trees next to a smaller, identical box, as if they had a bunch of those bricks left over from the main building, but not enough to build another whole one. No sign of men with rifles on the roof over there, or anyone, really. TJ pointed to the sky. I followed his finger, to where the birds circled lazily overhead. I shrugged. What am I supposed to be seeing? Man, talking to you. He smiled and shook his head. Like you a time traveler. No, wait. It's more like you're a caveman, they just unfroze. What is this strange devilry, future man? He pointed up again. Sniper drone. Three three eight caliber rifle pointed under an unmanned aerial vehicle. Computer-assisted targeting. Can put an anti-personal round into your brain from a thousand yards out. Did assassinations in Afghanistan. A lot neater than the Hellfire missiles that had taken out a tango on the entire kid's birthday party that tango was attending at the time. I looked up at the pair of tiny black crosses drifting below the clouds. I liked it better when I thought they were vultures. He continued, Now that I don't have the missiles, too. Them drones, they look tiny up in the sky, but on the ground they're pretty big, almost as big as a real plane. And those hellfires it's got under the wings. If we stood one up here, it'd be almost as tall as you. If things got out of control down here, drone could launch one down into the yard and take out 30 of us in one shot. Unmanned? So this place is being patrolled by robots? No, no, no. Remote control. Somewhere there's a dude sitting at a console, a cup of coffee on his right, jelly donut to his left, and on his screen is a black and white shot of this hospital, turning around and around real slow. He can go to infrared at night, switch to thermal in case there's too much fog, or if we get clever and try to create a smoke screen for cover. Maybe he's looking at us right now. Wave to him, but don't make any threatening moves. Man can zoom in so that your head will fill a screen. Gun barrel is stabilized by computer, automatically compensates for vibration, wind speed, everything. Okay. Okay? I ran my hands through my hair, thinking, Okay, so the operator is down there in one of those tents. Like, uh, if we can get somebody over there and beat the shit out of him? Nah, nah. We've been over all this before. Drone operations is several states away. In Nevada, believe it or not. The 17th Reconnaissance Squadron. Creech Air Force Base just outside of Vegas. And even though it's 1,800 miles or so from here, he hits his little red fire button. The command reaches the drone .75 seconds later. Fuck. I bent over at the waist. Breathe. Just breathe. I know, right? Weird to think that all the taxes you and me ever paid wouldn't even replace a broken wing on that shit. Just try to calm down, alright? Okay, so there's, there's two of them up there. He nodded. I'd say one's a spotter. Probably set to scan the whole grounds at once. The other's got the guns. Okay, so how about we... And before you ask, no. We can't all rush the walls to different spots at once to give them too many targets to hit. They got ground-based handwear outside the fence, unmanned units called gladiators. Just looked like little jeeps, only with no place for a driver to sit. Guns mounted on the back. Between them, they got sensors in the ground that detect vibration. They got motion detectors, body heat sensors, lasers, all that shit. Anything bigger than a bunny rabbit tries to sneak through, something bad will happen to it. And no, we don't have any way of tunneling out. Even if we had equipment, which we don't, and the means to do the work without the UAVs noticing, which we also don't, where do we tunnel to? We get no intel about the situation out there other than the fact that the damned Raper command center is right over there. 
I mean, I know the geography, and you probably do too. But even if we could find an exit spot with nice soft dirt, one that's secluded and not too far away, how do you know you don't pop up right into a patrol? Six weeks of digging, wasted. There's that word again. Raper. You ever hear of that in your life before this week? He shook his head. Nope. But when shit went bad last week and the CDC pulled out the people, this raper took their place. You see the gear on those guys? Hazmat suits tricked out with Kevlar. Modified M4s with targeting HUDs and their damned faceplates. You think they came up with that gear overnight? Shit. Each of those units probably cost half a million bucks. That's specialized equipment. And all these dudes know exactly what they're doing. They sweep in and suddenly they're in charge. They're ordering around us National Guard like we answer to them, and nobody says shit otherwise. They tell me to stay behind, and I'm like, bullshit, I'm getting on that chopper. But guess what? Here I am. Never seen anything like this. I walked back across the roof to look out at the rear of the building and a little strip of wood, wood that from up here looked like the end product of a Brazilian bikini wax. Smoke rose in the distance. Maybe somebody else's house on fire. <clears throat> I heard no sirens. TJ followed me and said, you know, this conversation is a lot more discouraging the second time around. I said, but there's somebody here. That's what I can't get over. The whole operation on this side looks like it's staffed by like two people. So what, it's all just the drones and sensors and shit? Well, yeah, they're trying to keep down the infection risk. They don't need people like me swelling the ranks of the infected. And if you ask me, the automated shit seems like it's working just fine. You saw that kid try to climb the fence. From behind us, a female voice said, You should write down everything he said up here, up, up. You should write down everything he said up to now, so he doesn't have to do it all again if your brains get scrambled next week. Hope had joined us on the roof. I said, I just don't accept that there's no way out of this place. I mean, it wasn't built as a prison, right? It was built as a hospital. No way they've covered everything. Hope laughed, and at TJ, she said, It's so funny to see him go through the five stages again. I said, The, the what? TJ explained, It's the same for everybody they dump in here. First, it's the confusion, right? What's happening? Where am I? That's stage one. But then you get to stage two. Pissed off. How can they do this to us, man? I got rights. Okay. Then there's stage three. Defiance. I gotta get out of here. There's gotta be a way out. Stage four is the depression. Why me, man? Boo-hoo. I wanna go home. I wanna see my girl. Then hopefully, you land at stage five, which is, we gotta make the best out of the situation and be smart. I really made it all the way to stage five before? Hope said, oh no. You stop somewhere between stage two and three.